Okay, Shalima, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that we get to do this. Um, we have been looking forward to creating a space like this where we could get together and talk about career, talk about um, working in the world, talk about all the different things that come together when we're looking to advance ourselves, to find our passions, to be able to do what we love uh, through a BIPOC lens, uh, specifically through a BIPOC lens. So uh, we're really excited to create, be creating the space. Um, I want to start off by sharing where we're located. So Shelly and I, um, your hosts today, are located in the Coast Salish people's land, specifically the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Semiamu, and Swasudan First Nations land. So we're honored to be joining you from here um, and to connect with people from all over the place. So thank you for joining us. Um, as we get started, I want to let you know, please share in the chat. You know, we want to hear what you're thinking, get your questions, your insights. Um, one of the things that I really loved about connecting through things like this in Zoom and on the online is to be able to actually make real connections through chat. So uh, if you want to, you can share your LinkedIn, share how to connect with each other. And um, we want to really start building a community where we can support each other and growing how we want to as well. Um, yeah, I think that's all we have to say as we get started. Um, keep it respectful. I think that's a given in this day and age. Um, and I think, you know, like one of the things that I'm coming in with is a lot of hopefulness and uh, curiosity and excitement for where we're going and inspiration, especially coming out of the inspiration that just happened in the US on Wednesday and the words that were so eloquently shared by Amanda Morgan. So um, that's certainly something that I'm bringing in today and, and being cognizant of how we can shape our futures, um, being how we can shape our futures as well. So yeah. So I'm going to pass it to Shelly to share a little bit about who we are, why we're doing this. Wonderful. Thank you, Shalima. Um, as Shalima mentioned, my name is Shelly Ann Vidal. Some of you know me. And for those of you who don't, um, thank you. I'm just going to ask um, if you, uh, as you're joining, if you can just put your microphones on mute if you haven't done so already. That would be wonderful. Um, uh, and then Shalima, if you can just jump in there and maybe mute people who are uh, not muted. Um, if they need some assistance with that. Um, one of the things I'd like to start off with sharing is the, our name of our company, was, which is Kaiso um, Careers. And some people might be wondering, okay, well, what does that mean and where did that come from? So Shalima and I, are, our parents are both from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. And as kind of homage to our roots, we decided on this name, Kaiso. And the the roots of this uh, word in itself comes from the Afro-Caribbean music um, from Trinidad and Tobago, which was um, established during the early to mid 19th century. And it's also um, the roots of, of the music actually come from West Africa. And it, it's got influences um, from like chutney, soul, funk, Latin, um, and all other islands within the Caribbean are kind of fused in there with Kaiso. The type of music was used to really help people communicate to one another in through music and dance and, and storytelling um, when there were restrictions pl placed on enslaved people. So this was a way for people to connect, share their stories directly um, with one another. So that's a little bit about the history of the, of the name. And I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I work full-time as an instructor at one of the colleges out here in uh, the greater Vancouver area. And outside of that, I also am the vice chair of the National Congress of Black Women. And I'm involved in Sisters Leading Sisters. I'm involved in this, obviously, and many other things. One of the things that I like to say is that I was born an advocate. I'm here to help uplift and amplify the voices of our community members. Shalima, you want to say a few words about yourself? Sure. So, um, yeah, my name is Shalima Cambridge. Um, my background is also Trinidadian, just like Shelley has uh, indicated our name, our, our, our company com name comes from. But uh, my background is in leadership and communications. I'm really, really passionate about people 
especially BIPOC folks, finding out what their leadership looks like and actually defining that for themselves um, and not letting others decide what that looks like for them. So that's, I'm really passionate about that. Um, I just love when people find the strengths that are important to them and, be, and are able to build on that. So in my day-to-day -day work, I work at Fraser Health, a health authority in, in close to where I live, and I, lead, I help uh, develop leaders, so people leaders in who they are, how they lead, how they connect and communicate with others. Um, and in other work that I do, I work in diversity and inclusion consulting, facilitating workshops in that area and coaching in that area as well. So it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, and then just bringing all that together for people like us folks to be able to thrive and grow in our careers. Wonderful. Um, one other thing that we wanted to share is why we're doing this work. Shalim and I um, saw that there was definitely a need for us to create a space where we could amplify the voices of BIPOC folks. folks. All too often, we have been asking to be, you know, for asking for a seat at the table, asking for an invitation. And out of, I think, honestly, pure frustration of that partially, we said, you know what, enough about asking and we are going to create our own table so that we can amplify not only our voices, but our community members um, that are BIPOC, plain and simple. That's what we're doing. So um, yeah. So uh, Shalima, I think you're, uh, Okay, Next. so with that, this is enough about us. I'd like to invite uh, our amazing guests. I'm so excited to have you here for our first session to introduce themselves. So we have Lystra Sam and Zoe Mitchell joining us. So uh, Lystra, let's start with you and hear a little bit about you. What should we know? <laughs> what should you know? Um, thanks so much, Shalima, and thanks, Shelly, for inviting my voice into this room today. Um, I am also um, would like to just take a moment to say that I'm coming to you um, from Coast Salish territories as well, um, Musqueam and um, Soleil-Lututh as well, and, and Squamish. Um, and uh, those are the lands that I live, play and work on. Um, I'm also coming to you as a fellow Trini. Uh, I like to call myself a Trinibagonian because um, my dad is a Trinidadian and my mom is a Tobagonian, were, I should say. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, about me, I mean, I... I'm really, first of all, I'm really honored that you guys, uh, you know, asked me to be here um, because I am all about leadership and I'm all about community. Um, one of my, I'm also all about, like, I'm a lifelong learner as well. So, and I don't think that that learning has to come from um, any specific, like, it's not like, you know, I'm the age that I am. I can only learn from people who are of my generation. I love learning from the younger generations and keeping my, you know, feet and hands in all the dishes, if you will. It's like a callaloo. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I have uh, three businesses now here. Um, one, the first one was created in 2017. I created Community, which is um, a travel and lifestyle company. And the reason it's lifestyle is because travel is a lifestyle. But m in more depth, it's because the company was created from a decolonial lens and an anti-racist lens. And it was created in order to uplift and serve um, very specific communities. Although anyone can have my curating and concierge um, uh, uh, you know, gifts um, to create their travel. Very specifically, I look at the Black and Indigenous people of color community. I look at the 2S LGBTQIA community. I look at people with disabilities and I look at solo women and femmes traveling, you know, alone. Um, and I hold hands with those communities to make sure that they are allowed the uplifting and dynamic, adventurous, world that is created throughout travel um, 
and safety in that as well. Uh, because that is something that I think is, well, I know for sure, I've looked at the stats, it's missing for um, Black people specifically will tell you, I think in about 80% that their, their most, their biggest concern when they're traveling is safety. Is it somewhere they're, where they're safe? To us LGBTQIA folks as well. Um, and as we know, there's an intersection of all of those, um, uh, those communities, right? So I myself um, am a cisgendered heterosexual woman, and I also live at the um, intersection of a person with a disability uh, that's a physical one and uh, a person who is Black, right? I'm, I'm Black and I'm female. So those are some of the intersections that I live on, and that's what, you know, part of what created this business. I've been in that industry for um, about, uh, well, 21 years this year, um, and went out on my own uh, about five years ago. Um, and then when, in 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, um, I was called by a lot of my friends to come and um, sit in workshops. I'm, I'm, I'm part of a lot of different business communities and a lot of the white women in these who ran these businesses are allies of mine, uh, true allies as in co-conspirators working on being accomplices. Um, and they reached into me and said, I can't think of any other voice I would want speaking right now than your own. So um, that actually um, moved into creating my next business, which is a Patreon membership uh, called Being an Ally with Lister Sam, where I actually will walk people through from beginners who not don't have a clue all the way up to people who are already co-conspirators and accomplices. And we do that through many different lenses like education and you know, reading and talks and workshops that I give and things like that. There are many, many levels to that. It's a huge scaffold that we're building kind of thing. Um, and in 2019, I met Shelly Ann Vidal, who is your partner in this business. And we met at a talk at Langara, which is my old alma mater where Shelly teaches. And um, she came and sat beside me. We then discovered we're both from Trinidad. And she asked me what I do. And I said, oh, I run this um, you know, concierge curating um, specialized travel company. And uh, she sa I said, you know, one of my favorite things to do um, are retreats. And she said, oh, I've always wanted to do a retreat as well. So we said, well, let's do one together. And we started building that out in 2019. And of course, COVID hit us in 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you know, grew, we, we, you know, we had to pivot with that as everybody had to and change. Um, and then we also ended up I had a dream one night that it should be a foundation and not just a retreat. And so I built out this whole other thing that is called Sisters Leading Sisters. Um, and uh, we're working on, you know, scholarships for the retreats. We're working on um, getting funding, uh, whether by donation or from the government for um, mental health care for women in leadership. Um, for getting any kind of modality that women want um, for care, uh, for their wellness as we move along, because we know that for Black, Indigenous, and women of color in the workforce, if we're leaders, we know that we put we don't put ourselves first, you know, and that mm -hmm. is an essential thing. So um, we're looking at ways to put us first and get support from um, the larger corporate community for funding that, create a board and do all those things and, you know, um, just get us going, building so that we can then flesh out to the community at large and we can work with other women as well and um, white women in particular, sit down, have those difficult conversations, um, have them, you know, learn how to become allies and accomplices. Um, create community with our Indigenous sisters and um, and grow from there. So those are my three businesses. As you can see from that, um, Shalima and everyone else who's listening, I am a very 
heart-centered, wholehearted builder as, as a leader. I call myself like, mm-hmm. I, I'd really rather use the word builder because I know that I, I lead, but also I feel like I build things, I build communities so that we can all interweb and interface and, you know, talk to each other and figure things out as we go. Um, mm-hmm. Because a lot of us, I think, don't have that um, or didn't have that um, leadership in our own lives. Like we didn't have anyone to look to outside of our homes, um, perhaps, when we were in the corporate place who looked like us. So Absolutely. this is a big opportunity for us to look at each other and say, hey, I've got people who look like me, who can mentor me, who I can mentor back um, and who will always uplift me and amplify my voice and my skills for the betterment of me, not for the betterment of the dollars they can make for me. You know, mm. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Um, I mean, that sounds amazing, Lystra, and what I'm hearing there is, you know, even in you sharing your journey to where you're, what you're doing right now, a lot of transition, a lot of focus on leadership and, you know, finding out what you can bring to the table. Um, And I think, you know, that's a theme that we want to touch on is how do we decide, like, how do we determine what are the skills that we want to bring forward and doing that in a way that's authentic to us. And I know Zoe, you've gone through that same process as well of looking at, you know, where I am right now, this amazing skills that you were bringing in the work that you did and then transitioning into doing your own thing too. So Zoe, if, if you can share a bit about yourself and what you do and how, you know, this, this theme of leadership and taking, uh, bringing that leadership into a place where you want it to be uh, came about for you. Awesome. Uh, Good afternoon, because I'm in a different time zone. I'm in Ontario. Um, I'm on actually the Mississauga of the Credits and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I always mess this up, Haudenosaunee land, Um, pardon my my, uh, pronunciation. And I'm coming from a very different space. I'm coming from the corporate space that Lystra is is mentioning. So I used to be a 20-year corporate finance leader um, and coming from a very corporate environment where I did not feel like I could bring my authentic self. I didn't, I couldn't. The only time I did was with my teams. So as Lystra is saying about making sure that we have the leaders in place and so on, I was an inclusive leader, but did I feel included? Absolutely not. One, because I was a black female in a senior leadership team. Well, did I look across the table? There was no one else looking like me. I didn't know anybody else in the industry that I could speak to. So it was very lonely, Um, the microaggressions, pardon me, going on. Um, It was very, oh, that is my phone, sorry, one second. Pardon me. Um, It was very frustrating and lonely for me to be sitting in a room, speaking to my team, telling my team to be one way, and I couldn't be that way myself. And I just really got to a point where I said, I can't do this anymore. So there wasn't really one particular thing going on. It was the constantly sitting there, being ignored in boardrooms, feeling like I can't be there, I can't speak up, no one's interested. That moved me to what I'm doing today, which is consulting. Um, I'm actually a full-time consultant in the DEI space as well as process improvement. But my goal is on the leadership side to really drive employee engagement. So I use those, those, those tools, but it's really to make people feel like they can come to work every day and they can do their best work and feel like they belong. So when you want to go to work and, and perform to your highest potential, that's where my sweet spot is. And I always knew that in finance and I got tired of the finance side of it. And when I decided to say that's enough, I was like, well, what am I going to do? And that was the one thing that really held it all together for me. So I've been doing this for two years full time. Um, Obviously with COVID, I slowed right down and um, lost track. But unfortunately with the murder of George, then my phone started uh, ringing again. Um, So it's sad, but that's basically how my transition happened to being consultant today. 
Well, thanks, Zoe. And, you know, some of the things that came up from what you're talking about is that engagement piece and how so often, you know, you talked about the microaggressions, you talked about not feeling included. And so often that happens when you are, you know, the BIPOC person in a workplace or the only of a certain thing in a workplace. Um, and, you know, that that lack of being able to feel I can be myself here. Um, and so I'm curious to find out from both of you, because uh, Lister, you also talked about like the reason why you're creating the business that you have is the ability to actually create a space for people to connect, people to actually see themselves the way that they want to with others that see grab some. So, you know, I'm curious to find out what were some of the key things around um, that you saw in the workplace around engagement, around you know, power, the dynamics, you know, the political dynamics that take away from that inclusion and take away from that engagement that you would have liked to be there. Yeah, Zoe, do you want to take that or do you sure. want me to? No, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Lister. Yep, yeah, go ahead. I, you know, I, I've been in and out of corporate um, since I was uh, about 18, maybe 17 even. Um, and the only time that I was th thinking about this earlier today, as a matter of fact, the only time that I felt that I could bring my entire self to work and be seen and heard was in that very first job that I had. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was because I had what people would today call moxie, <laughs> you know, like I was just, I don't give a shit. I'm just going to say what I want, do what I want. And I know I do it well. And so there was this bravado that was a really decent mix of ego and actual confidence. So there was arrogance and confidence blended. I really don't recommend that for anyone, <laughs> unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> but um, because of that, like, you know, I would do things and the leader of the company would come in um, and uh, this was a Levi's brand that I was running their, all of their Western Canada um, uh, stores for them. And, um, you know, and, I, and that took about 18 months for me to get to that position because I was just a firebrand, right? And I had all the energy in the world. And I, when the boss would come in, um, who was, you know, at the time, the owners of Levi, and he would say, oh, I want you to do this. I'd go, no, that's stupid this is what we're gonna do instead. And I'll show you why, because I've been doing this and I would just say what I had to say. And he really appreciated that. So he kept, you know, um, advancing me and then just basically left me to run the company how I wanted to run it. Um, so that was probably the only time that I felt fully seen and fully heard showing up as who I am, you know? Um, and unfortunately, in corporate, I think that they lose a lot of, well, I don't think it, I know it. They lose a lot of like amazing ideas and creation um, and involvement and voices, et cetera, because they don't allow us to show up as who we are fully what they and they uh, and this is i'm not even gonna like put blame on someone to say you know they're shitty bosses or that sort of thing it is because of a lack of understanding that we are working within a white supremacist system and within that system i am called to show up as white as i possibly can well that's mm -hmm. fucking impossible right um just on the face of it, right? But then there's the um, assimilate to whiteness so that I can be closer to whiteness. And you know what? All, what does that do? That just chips away at our soul. It chips away at our, at our personality. It chips away at our ideation, our creativity, our joy, which helps to build all of those good relationships and all the great ideas that we could bring to the table. And then we are these silent bodies that they have 
showing up and not putting in all the things that we can put in to create, you know, better work environments and, and, and be good at what it is that we are hired to do. Um, I, I don't think that I can honestly say I've always excelled in the corporate space, but I've done that at a, at, at doing harm to myself. You know, mm-hmm. it's cost me. It's always left a void in me because I'd have to find what I was looking for to be whole. And like, I couldn't integrate all of myself in the workplace, right? And if I don't for a minute think that that doesn't happen 99% of the time, you know? So I think that that's a lot of, a lot of what's missing is that awareness of white supremacy so that they can be in fact inclusive. The diversity piece, it's like, that's, you know, you can add a hundred black people, a hundred black indigenous and people of color into your workspace and not change anything. And it's going to be the same white supremacist fucking space all day, every day anyway. So unless you show up, as someone who understands what it is to be an ally and a co-conspirator and really want to have your business built with the people that will build that business and not coming to me from a, here's my budget and here's the red line and here's the black line. So come to me because the people are who is going to make or break your business, you know, and if you don't know that, then you don't know business, you know what I mean? So um, and and so unless you can come to it from that place, then you're really just creating more of the same and you're just going to be leaving people running through like they'll stay for a year, they'll stay for two years, they'll stay for five years and then they'll leave because they're not happy. They can't be happy not being able to show up as their whole self. That's if I could add to that too, let's just hit on a few points that I was going to share as well. The sense of being or feeling like you belong and making that be the foundation of your company speaks volumes to the profit levels. And I speak that because I can see the P&Ls. I can see financially the impacts of when people feel like they don't belong or they can't contribute or when they stop working and when they don't care and they make lots of errors and they forget to do things. It's costly. And a lot of companies don't stop and look at how much it's costing them on top of recruiting, retaining, turnover. These are all metrics that a lot of companies don't stop and look at. So if I share a personal story, I've sat in a board meeting where it's a strategy meeting. So it's a cross-functional, there's marketing, there's all sorts of different partners in the room. And in my financial role, my job was to point out anything that financially looks concerning, red flags. So I'm sitting in this meeting and I look down at the deck provided and I thought, "Uh uh-oh, there's something wrong with these numbers and raise the hand. This is my job. I raise the hand and there's EVPs in the room and I say, something's wrong with these numbers. We can't make decisions based on these numbers. And the entire room went dead quiet. People stopped, they turned, some looked at their page, some kind of panicked like, ah, what are we supposed to do here? No one said a thing. And then two of the EVPs continued speaking as if I had said absolutely nothing. The meeting continued. Everybody got up and walked out of the room and I'm sitting there humiliated. My boss was across from me. Nobody at one point ever stopped and said to me, why do you think that? What are the impacts? What? This was my job and I'm not doing it. I wasn't an analyst and I'm tooting my horn here. I'm director level right? And I was completely ignored. That meeting, I walked out of there, and it wasn't the first, it wasn't the last. That meeting, we walked away, $2 million lost in top line revenue. Nobody said a thing. That wasn't the only time. Another meeting was $5 million, right? These are corporations, and this is what's happening when you don't allow people to have a voice. And on my teams, as a result of that, I swore no one would ever work for me and feel the way that I did. Because how humiliating is that to have a room full of colleagues, no one says anything for you, your boss is in the room, and no one says anything for you. And so on my team, to Lister's point, I didn't have turnover. I had the highest number of engaged employees. My, My engagement scores were bang on, right? 
I couldn't do anything else for my team but protect them. But as a result of doing so, I became the target, which I was fine with. But it's a self-sacrifice that most leaders are not willing to take or they don't know how to take it. So I'll mm. leave there. Wow, that's powerful. I think, um, wow. Just to dovetail into what you're really speaking about, which is bringing your authentic self to work and then not, and then being ignored, being dismissed, and just like the erasure of it all is, is, is disgusting. I wanted to ask Lystra, um, was there a specific point in your corporate career where you said, enough, I can't handle this, and you decided to like take that leap off and just um, go into business on your own? Because I know through some of our conversations, you know, you've been in corporate for many years and then you got to a point. So if you don't mind um, sharing that with the audience, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Shelly. And you know what, Zoe, thanks for sharing those two really important stories with us because that happens, I think, way more than people even understand, you know? So thanks for that. Um, Shelly, you know, I have left corporate on and off my entire life since my, you know, working when I was 17 or whatever. Um, I have been a serial entrepreneur uh, because I, well, because, you know, it's fun and it also makes you a little bit wild, but, you know, it's fun. Um, and in terms of um, a specific point, I've had two very specific events that I can think of that, you um, changed my mind about corporate, although one sent me into corporate, but in a very different way. Um, and the other pulled me out of it. So the first was, and this is a, a super long story that I won't get into, but the first was the passing of my parents into ancestry. Um, and um, that happened at a very close, uh, like they were, they passed away very close to each other. And um, in my grief, I ended up having a, um, I don't know any way to say this. It's gonna kind of, I think it's weird for people, but um, I just ended up, the, the universe <laughs> threw me together with um, my musical icon, fabulous person that I loved in the world and still love in the world so much, which was Prince. And we ended up actually having a little bit of a friendship. He was kind of a mentor for me. Um, and so that, I, it was like our first time ever kind of meeting. And then we had this big talk and he basically just let me, you know, snot cry in his arms and just kept telling me that, you know, I had a really special light and I should not let it go out basically. So I, within I think about six weeks of that first meeting, um, I packed up my entire life um, and I left Canada and I thought I was going away to find some sort of peace for six months. Pero, but I ended up leaving for 11 years <laughs> and traveling around the world and being, you know, sometimes in corporate, mostly in corporate, but really kind of like with my own vibe, if you will. Um, and um, then I came back to Canada and I went into the travel industry, which was kind of always on the edge of what I was doing anyway, because I was traveling with it all. Um, and I, in that industry, I got into a car accident. I, I was a pedestrian. I got hit by a, a taxi driver while I was crossing the street. And um, I was going to work, like I went to work like three days later, like I, I think it was on a weekend or something. So on the Monday I went to work on crutches. Um, I managed during that time to pull in one of the largest accounts um, as a business development manager that um, my, not just my team, but anyone in my position had pulled in, I don't know, 
and I was new at this position as well. I think I was in it for about six months at that time. And, um, and I was, I just kind of kept working, but then I was like, but I'm in pain every day. I go home and like, no one seems to be that concerned about my pain, except for me. I go home and fall into bed because I'm exhausted from managing pain all day long. Uh, and then, you know, again, managing myself and showing up for my teams. And after doing that for about six months, I was like, these people don't give a shit about you. Like, what are you doing? You could die tomorrow. They'll just fill your spot. Like, so I just felt, again, very empty, very lonely. Zoe, you talked about this sense of loneliness, this lack of belongingness, um, which honestly is the third thing behind food and shelter it's, it's the third thing that we look to fulfill as human beings, you know, so if you don't have belongingness in a place where you're spending, you know, eight to 12 hours of your day, good luck having a fulfilled life, right? So, um, so yeah, I, I, I took a leave, a health uh, wellness leave from work. And when I took that leave, I felt so free. Um, and I, traveled a bit and I, you know, did some really good soul searching with some coaches. And I knew that I couldn't go back. I just couldn't. And on the day that I went back to go back, <laughs> I actually walked in and went, oh yeah, no, I quit. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so I went to HR. I actually went to um, my executive leader and said to her, yeah, today's the day I'm leaving. And she was like, but you just came back. And I went, yeah, I can't be here. And honestly, after like the paperwork and all that kind of stuff, when I walked out of that office, I kid you not when I tell you, I skipped down the street. Like I was free and it really felt like I like someone had just like released the noose you know like I was free and I didn't have a clue what I was gonna do I was like oh shit what have I just done you know but also I was like oh no you don't make decisions like this rashly you know what you've just done you know um I knew I emancipated myself and it took me about a year about 14 or 15 months um, to figure out, first of all, what was going on with my body physically through seeing some specialists. This is when I got diagnosed with my disability. And then I did went, okay, you know, there's a few things that you love to do. I've been an activist. Um, I'm going to age myself here and say for, uh, about 35 years. And I have, had very, a lot of loves, you know, like psychology is a big love of mine and people, I love to love to love and hate people. I don't know what that is all about, you know? Um, and um, people, I really dig, you know, communities very specifically, I dig um, and learning, I really, really dig travel. I absolutely love teaching. I absolutely adore. So I was just like, all right, let's figure out a way to put all that together and um, keep raising people up and, uh, and, and make you enough money to you know, live your life. I'm not, anyway, so that's to answer your question. I, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you, Lystra. Shalina, do you wanna take the next one? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that I'm, that I'm drawn to is how both of you have been able to you know, be in environments that perhaps were not healthy, that weren't feeling like a place of belonging, but then still transition into something that is uplifting for yourselves, that, you know, you feel confident in doing. And I'm curious to understand, like, how does that happen? Like, what are the things that you draw on, um, you know, even coming out of, you know, environments that where you, your, confident may, your confidence may be tested, you know, so we, we, and you sharing how, no one listened to you. Like that could be a huge blow. So I'm curious to find out how do you grasp onto those things that will be your confidence boosters as you make transitions? You know, not everyone will transition into 
being entrepreneurial, but many times it's that transition into a new career or deciding I'm going to change to a new company. And how do you actually just make that decision and say, yes, I can do this after experiencing some of those difficult points? So I can, yeah, yeah, I can tell you what I did. So several years ago, I knew I wanted to be out of finance. And to your point, what on earth was I going to do? So people said, well, you're forecasting and budgeting, go to a bank. And I went, Ugh. no offense to banks, <laughs> right? We like banks. Um, but it's, it was more about what am I going to do to make sure that I feel like I can be authentic and I can feel, fulfill my purpose. And to me, the answer to your question is around purpose. What is it that you do so well that it becomes natural to you? It's central to your core and it doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as you're fulfilling that part, it doesn't feel like work. So for example, when I was looking to leave my last role, i.e. career, um, I looked at uh, what it is that I think I did well. So I start off by asking friends, when you think about me or you have a problem or you're thinking about referring me to somebody, what is it you're coming to me for? What is it that you think that I do better than somebody else? Or is what is it that you pick up the phone and you say, I just want your opinion on? Am I that person for you for certain things? So it starts to get you kind of knowing yourself, knowing how you show up in the world, knowing what people see in you that you probably can't see or that someone has beaten you down to the point where you can't see it anymore. So I asked my employees, I asked people, I play soccer. So I asked people on my team, I would ask anybody just in a random question, can you do me a favor and let me know when you think of me, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? So that takes it away from me from having to find it in myself because as you said, I lost a lot of it. I was just filled with anxiety, stress, frustration, anger, bitter all the time, right? And that's the beginning of it. The other thing I did personally is I found myself a purpose coach, total fluke. I was at women's uh, workshops and a lady mentioned to me, I see you and I know you're in pain and your teams are thriving, but you're dying. I do some other work. Would you like to join me? And I realized she does purpose work. So once I, I knew my purpose and what it was, it didn't matter what I transitioned to as long as I was fulfilling it. I almost went to law school. I started applying and everything. I was headed to law school because I wanted to protect people. But my purpose is actually giving people a voice, letting them be seen, and solving it. Well, yes, I could do that with law, but there's so many other ways that I could do that. So I didn't have to incur that eighty to hundred thousand dollar fee to go back to school. Plus, I have a daughter and married, and all this other stuff going on in my life. I didn't have to do that. And the work that I'm doing right now with process improvement, it's adding a voice to pain. It's making sure that I see people, I'm validating their experiences at work and I'm solving it. Diversity, equity, inclusion, it's the same thing. You're giving people a voice, you're building the belonging, you're building up leaders and you're creating workplaces where people can come and feel like they're validated and they're seen. So as long as I knew that purpose, I could transfer. It doesn't have to be a one and done. You don't have to stay in the industry that you're in. You, don't, you can move. So I would, I would leave it there. <laughs> I just want to draw attention to that nugget of advice that you gave around asking others what mm -hmm. come to me for. I love that because so often we don't see the gifts that we have, but when we can ask people, what, what do you know me for? What is, what do you see me as important as? That's where, you know, you can start to look at what your purpose is. I love that. Absolutely. It's drawing back into our community. Um, those who love us and surround us and asking them for their thoughts and, and, and their opinions um, so they can validate what we sometimes forget and we get it gets lost along the way in, in this navigating of this corporate um, system. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things along with this idea of, you know, finding your purpose and being able to lean into that and use that as a place to either decide what your next step is, what your next career is, if you're looking to transition, or like what kind of business you want to create for yourself, if that's where you want to go. It's also this idea of like marrying success in this area, as well as your purpose and, you know, your calling. And I'm curious because like so many people say you can't do that. You either have to just focus on the success, focus on the money and like, let that be the driver or 
focus on what you're passionate about. Things might fall into place, but you know, just be realistic about what your goals are if that's the case. So where do you both fall in terms of being able to bring those two together and how you can find success in doing that? I was going to give this one to Zoe to go first because I realize I just keep rambling on. <laughs> um, and uh, that is such a good question because Zoe used the key word when she said purpose. Because if you don't know your purpose, I feel like you will be lost, you know? Um, I have to say that a couple of things come up for me when I think about that. I had a plan for my life when I was eight years old. <laughs> I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how I wanted to do it. Um, I had this like whole plan to go like live in Paris, have my little fashion boutique. I was going to be a designer. Um, I was going to travel around the world um, and I was going to read a lot. Maybe I didn't actually think this when I was like eight, nine, 10 years old, but as I grew a little, not much older, but a little older, I was like, I'm not going to have a husband. I kind of want to have a daughter. So I guess I've got a dog. Like I had this picture, right? And um, by the time I was, 29, um, I had achieved the things that I had added to that list and all of those things that I had on that list when I was eight. And I was like, now what am I supposed to do? So I thought I could retire for a while. Like I really thought, oh yeah, just go play tennis and be a lady that lunches. That's fine, you know? And this is why this is so, the purpose is so important because about eight months into it, I realized that I was going to the gym twice a day. I was playing tennis. I was going for lunches, drinking way too much wine at lunch. Um, I was, you know, clubbing. I was, I really wasn't like, I was, I was not feeling good, you know, like on the inside. And when I turned 30, I woke up that morning and went, wow, you think you know every like really everything like you think you got it all you got it all figured out no take your ass back to school <laughs> okay um and the reason that I had that conversation with myself was because I realized that what was missing where the feeling of not feeling great that sort of empty feeling was coming from was I wasn't fulfilling any purpose anymore and so that's why I believe what Zoe was saying about purpose is so important. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an anchor for us, right? Um, and so for me, the authenticity, the, the, the purpose and the success, they do go hand in hand. I don't know any other way to be. And I, the other thing I connect this to is my parents. My parents raised kids very intentionally to be leaders. We could not be followers. We, it just wasn't allowed, <laughs> you know? And as I know across the board with three Trinis and a Jamaican, with <laughs> Caribbean people in That's this. That's what I was gonna we, say, as Trinis, we all know, Caribbean, yes, we know. This, is not, this is not just my folks. This yeah. is a regular thing. It's like, yeah. no kids of mine are gonna be following behind anybody sniffing their you know, behind. It's like, y'all are gonna be the ones who are gonna lead everybody else. So I, I feel like I was reared to be in the place that I am. I was reared to have this purpose um, that goes beyond me, really, it, this is not me. This is my creator and my ancestors talking, right? That it's, when I am trying to only serve me, no, that just does not fulfill me. It doesn't feel good at all. When I am trying to serve a larger community, when I'm trying to, when I, you know, yes, serve the larger community in any way, shape or form, um, I feel great. So it's, you know, people will say, oh, that's altruistic. It's like, no, that's selfish as hell, you know? Um, 
and 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 it works both ways, right? So because I I get the fulfillment and then I keep being filled up and I that my cup runneth over and it runs right back into community again, you know. So um, the idea of not being able to put your purpose and your money making machine together is I think it's a cop out, quite frankly, and I think it that cop out comes from external. Um, information. So it comes from the white supremacist system that we are meant to follow the script in walking our lives in. Um, and that script says, you know, get a boss and let the boss tell you who you're supposed to be and do that in order to get a paycheck. And that is, that's bullshit. That's just crap, you know? So um, it, it may take longer to find that great company that you want to be with. Um, it may take longer even to figure out like how to put your skills together to create your own business, but it can be done and trust what trust and believe when I tell you I have done this. I was talking to a friend yesterday and I said, I have created recreated myself within career. I have done that at least six times since I'm 30 years old, at least mm -hmm. six times. It, you know, it, it, and if you really want to self-reflect all the time, like that doesn't stop, you know? Um, and so the other piece that I want to say there too is authenticity is this buzzword that people are, you know, tossing around a lot and not understanding, I believe, not taking the time to self-reflect and understand that authenticity is about being true to yourself. And success, as I said, that outward gaze, right? That outward feeding of the prescription that we're given from society as to how our life is supposed to go. I think that that is what informs most people's um, idea of what success is. And if you, again, you need to, we need to look at ourselves and decide, like deconstruct these prescriptions and reconstruct them for our own selves with our own um, ideologies, you know, attached to that. What is my value? What do I value? Because if money is your idea of success and it's the only thing, I'm pretty sure, and, and there's nothing wrong with money. Uh, you know, I love money as well. I love the good that money can do. I love that I know that I'm a person that can be trusted with large sums of money to do good things with it. I don't need a plane. I don't need a yacht, you know, I, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't even know who needs them, but whatever, you know? And so given that, I think that I, well, I know that I've developed for myself, my own um, uh, ideology, value system, ethic system around success. And that means sharing the knowledge that I, you know, glean. It means mentoring, you know, and again, being mentored. It means taking care of my community in whatever way that I need to take care of them, whatever ways that they need taking care of. So it means listening and it means learning. It means not being the only, like never ever being the only one in a room with a voice or never ever thinking that, um, I'm the smartest person in the room. I've always got something to learn from everyone. So that for me is being authentic and wholehearted and, and, and it just, you can, I, for me, that's my recipe for success. Like that will, from that will come success. I just don't worry about the rest of it at all. And that also has to do with knowing that like I come from a place where, you know, profit sharing, um, scholarships, things like that are really, really important um, for all of my businesses. Making sure to pay, you know, any of my employees a living wage. It just, all of these things, like these are, fundamental to me and that is what success is to me making sure that the people and the teams that I have working with me that they are feeling whole and fulfilled in what they're doing not because I need them to stay with my company but so that they can go out in the world and do whatever it is they want to do and know how to lead in that as well so when I have hire people on or mentor people in my businesses I do it with that in, in, in my mind, like I'm asking them, like, what is it you want to do in life? And 
when they tell me that, I'm like, okay, let me help you with the skills that I have that will help you leave my company, you know? Because I know while they're there, they're gonna give me everything they've got. So <laughs> that to me is success and authenticity. That's beautiful, Estra, thank you. Um, and Zoe, I wanna hear from you too as to like, you know, how do you marry those or what do you see as being married in those? Then we have a final fun question for both of you, so. <laughs> um, I, I, Lystra said most of what I was going to say. Um, for me, two part as well, when I had my teams, I made sure just like Lystra, they, that I set them up for success. That includes not promoting them when they weren't ready. That includes putting them on projects that I know would help stretch them to where I knew they wanted to be, not where I wanted them to be. So, right, like identifying that the company always has a plan for people, but what's your plan? So for me, that was part of my success as a leader. Then my personal success, which is what I do in my role today as a consultant, is making sure that leaders understand how to lead. Most people get a promotion because they did a good job. They don't get the promotion to be a leader because they're a good leader. They're also set up to fail because they're not given leadership skills. They're not trained how to lead people. They can just execute something. So for me, part of my success is building up others. I love teaching and learning just like Lystra. That's part of my personal mission in life is to always be teaching or learning or both. Um, so as long as I can bring my authentic skill set to the table and what I want to do, so my rules of engagement are what my values align with somebody that I'm working with and that I'm working the way I want to work, not how you think I'm supposed to be working. <laughs> to me, that's success because then I can work and I can contribute and I can give at my full 100% because I'm doing it the way that I want to do it. And that in entrepreneurship actually allows me to do. Corporately, I, I couldn't, um, not in the full way that I wanted to outside of just being with my team. So that, that would be my only extra contribution. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you for both of you for sharing your stories, for being here, for being open to sharing, you know, what's really up, <laughs> how you made those transitions, how you were able to draw on your strength um, to do that. And uh, just as we close, um, I just want to let everyone know we've put a link to a form, a Google form in the chat. We'd love to get your feedback on this, but also for you to connect with us to see what else we should be doing in this space. We're gonna to continue to have these talks um, regularly. So watch for these, connect with us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Just search at Kaiso Careers. Um, and then also, you know, as we close, because we want to be true to who we are, uh, we have a <laughs> question for all of you. Uh, we want you to let us know if you are a fast wine, slow wine, slow wine, red, red wine. wine, or a white wine. <laughs> <laughs> and why? I'll go first. <laughs> For multiple reasons, um, I'm going to say fast wine. I like to move. I'm always juggling multiple things at the same time because I like to dig in and get as much from the moment as I can. <laughs> I also like music. <laughs> I like to run fast, which is why I play soccer. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Wonderful. Restra? Did I hear red wine or white wine? <laughs> they were there yeah, options people, too, absolutely. <laughs> I think I'm more of a slow wine actually and a white wine as well. Um and I, I remember when I used to be a fast wine <laughs> and now it just takes me longer to get through all of the things that I want to get through. So I, I kind of slow things down a bit, but also the reason why um, I, I know that things have slowed down for me too is because I also believe that one of the most radical things that we can do for ourselves and for each other is to rest. Mm -hmm. And so I make that a very um, conscious and intentional part of my day and my week and et cetera, of my life in, in particular. So that's it. Thanks. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation with um, Lystra, Zoe, and Shalima, and myself. We're so glad oh, that yeah. everyone enjoyed. Yeah, we're glad that everyone um, joined in um, to participate with some of the chat and listened in. And I, we hope that you gained some wonderful nuggets from this conversation. And as Shalima mentioned, and I saw in some of the chat, there were a few people commenting and they thought that other people, you know, would really benefit from this. So if you think other people would benefit, again, fill out the form that we, uh, the link for the form that we have in here and uh, follow us because we hope to have another one in about a month's time. So we look forward to um, connecting with you all again and thanks for your participation. And on that note, I'm going to leave us with a little bit of a song. So thank you so much and feel free to exit whenever. Or stay and dance a while. <laughs>